Yeah. Alrighty, uh, hello, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, the BBA's first uh, industry events of 2022 term, uh, bid term. Um, today we have a, a special guest with us, um, James Warren, a former <laughs> bid, bid student and a BBA alumni. Um, I'm guessing it's been a while since you've been in school, James, um, but uh, uh, we're happy to have you here today. Yeah, my my graduating year from BIT was twenty uh, December twenty seventeen. Okay, so <coughs> five years isn't isn't too bad. Um, but yeah, no, this is just gonna be a uh, anyone curious. It's just gonna be a simple Q and A uh, between yeah. students students and uh, you, James. Um, yeah, sounds sounds good. Yeah, I'm I'm an open book. Whatever you guys want to know or ask, I'm 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 here. But I did not prepare anything. Yeah, me me either. Don't <laughs> worry. This is a kind of kind of winging it, and it's kind of low key, and it's a it's a it's a good good time to uh, meet other people, I guess, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, how about you uh, start off by uh, telling a little bit about yourself, just uh, your story. Yeah, sure. So um, actually, when I joined um, the BIT program, uh, that was its. I think it was the second term, maybe maybe the second or third term that it was actually the BIT program. It was still CAP before then. Um, and then, uh, yeah, well, I was actually on a wait list for welding. I wasn't going to go do anything IT related at all, but the wait list for welding was too long. Um, it was like two years or something. Um, and so I ended up um, just looking online. I got a notice from Red River College. They're like, hey, we're accepting applicants, whatever. Like, go take your entrance exam. Uh, that test you guys have to take to see if you're going to do the direct entry. Do you guys still do that? Uh, like the IBIT thing? or like the um, um... So there, there's a test that you used to have to take. Uh, I don't know if you still do, but... Yeah, but it was it, it was waived for like the, I think the 2020 admissions. So because oh, of COVID, yeah. yeah, they couldn't hold it online and they decided to waive it, so... Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, be, at least before then, you had to either pass the test in order to go into the BIT program, or you were forced to take IBIT. Um, so I, I told myself, I was like, cool, I'll, I'll take the test. If I pass, I'll do BIT. If not, I'm going to wait for welding. Um, and I passed, so I decided to take the BIT program. Uh, Crazy how things can change that fast. <laughs> welding to IT. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I had a job lined up in, in uh, Alberta with um, a co-worker of a cousin of mine had a rig out there. So like I had my <laughs> apprenticeship all lined up, all my Red Seal stuff. Like I knew exactly where I was going. And then, yeah, it totally shifted. Um, I knew I wanted to start a business um, relating to IT when I started school. Um, I knew I didn't want to be a programmer. Um, for those that are, are curious, I don't program almost at all these days. Um, I still work with my team on, you know, problems and issues, architecting, like I'm very tied into the ecosystem. Uh, I just, just don't have fingers on keyboards very much uh, in, in actually writing lines of code. Um, but uh, yeah, I knew I wanted to start a business. Um, I came up with a couple ideas in term two. Um, and then it was, um, by the time I got back from term three, I actually joined the Navy. Um, the Royal Canadian Navy, met my business partner uh, prior to going for basic training. Um, and then we turned an idea that he had uh, when he was in high school. He's a self-taught programmer into um, a company that we eventually named Do North Systems. Um, and then, yeah, so I started that business when I was uh, in between my third and last term of, of school over the summer. Um, and then my last terms in school were all focused around um, courses and classes that I wanted to use to be able to uh, fill in knowledge gaps for my my new business. Um, and then the rest is history. We've uh, we now got uh, five developers on the team. Um, we're uh, we're capital funded. Uh, we do a lot of R and D. Um, yeah, we got customers all over North America. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's uh, super exciting. I mean. When I was in term two, I didn't really think about starting a business per se. Um, I'm guessing you were trying to like fill in a gap, I'm assuming, when you were in term two, or I'm guessing it's just a niche or like a drive or something. What do you mean by fill in a gap? Like, so people usually start a business, right? To uh, 
to fill in to fill in like a, a need in the industry or like um, I'm guessing you wanted to just start a company in terms maybe yeah, all, like that? all I knew I, is that I wanted to start a company I had no oh, okay what I wanted to start I oh, just knew I wanted to start something and then I wanted to be my own boss because I have a hard time taking direction so right. what uh, what what better way to then to become your own boss yeah for sure that's like Right on. I guess everyone's cool. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, it's uh, I've, I've actually went through a whole ordeal myself. I wanted to, uh, I did plumbing, and then I ended up coming into the BIP program um, just because I didn't want to do that. But uh, yeah, no, this is uh, super exciting to uh, hear that you have a, a similar path as I do. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what's the average term that you guys are in here? Uh, I'm term two. Yeah, I'm term two. Yeah, yeah. yeah term two. Term three. <laughs> yeah. Term three. Early, early, earlier terms. Yeah. Okay. And then just correct me because it's been a while. It's term one, term two, term three. Then you do co-op. Yeah. Co-op. And then you come back for a fourth and optional fifth term. Yeah, but like nowadays, it's like kind of um, you can actually switch it up. You can actually have your co-op as your last um term now. It's like. Yeah, it's 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 really crazy how uh, COVID like actually influenced the uh, our program really. Um, there's also the option of the project space, which I believe there's some projects that are just kind of voluntary, and then there's some projects that you can actually be paid for supposedly. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that happens at Red River. Yeah, I think James, you I read the article about that. Um, I don't know if uh, you want to talk about that too. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be happier to talk about more like specific questions, but just to preface that. Um, sure. So my, I actually applied to get into the project space in my fourth term, um, but the college wouldn't let me in because I was still a full-time student. And <laughs> they had issues with a student leading a project of other students. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to wait until uh, January 2018 uh, for me to actually start my project. Um, but yeah, I went right from graduation to running um, two projects in the project space. Um, and then I also consulted with some of the research projects in the project space. Um, so I did a lot of work there. I worked with uh, like dozens of students at a time. Um, and then through my work in the project space, um, I'm not sure if there's still ghosts of these rumors floating around or not. Um, but there was uh, one of the instructors. So I came back as a EA for a couple of courses. So I was an EA for database. Um, for uh, sysadmin, for uh, programming one and two, and um, what other course was I in EA for? Um, uh, oh yeah, server, server admin. Oh, okay. uh, yes, one and two. Um, server admin sucks. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's funny. I'm taking that right now, and we just have to get a textbook online. So yeah, yeah this is it's, uh, funny. <laughs> it's it's growing. Um, <laughs> Um, anyways, the so yeah, I was an EA for a bunch of classes, and then uh, one of the instructors was actually assaulted just off campus downtown, um, and then I picked up his job and came in as an instructor. So then I taught programming for a term. Uh, yeah, oh, wow. so I've been everything from student to project to researcher to instructor um, in your program. So I, there's really nothing I haven't done. I've been a part of the planning process for planning courses. I've been a part of the testing process. I've challenged credits uh, in the program. I've I've done it all, or at well, least that, that I'm sounds, aware of. So yeah, that sounds that sounds pretty chaotic coming yeah. in like as an instructor programming. Yeah, well, and, and <laughs> during all that as a student, I, I helped start the BBA. So I was the first vice president and then the second president of this iteration of the BBA. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You started that off with uh, Tara Brown. Once Founding so, fathers of the BBA. So, so <laughs> Tara Brown, is she still involved? Uh, no, currently we have uh, just recently um, at the beginning of last year, we had a new staff liaison come in okay. to a with the BBA, but uh, yeah. we, still, we still keep in touch with, uh, with Tara once in a while. Yeah, so Tara was our staff liaison, uh, but it was uh, Derek and myself that started the group. Right. Um, and then it was a choice of us because Tara had actually originally um, started a BBA group 
uh, or similar like group um, like 10 years prior when she was in the CAP program. Um, it only lasted for one or two terms and then it it, um, it just didn't didn't stick around. Yeah. So she was happy to be our, our liaison when we got it going. And I'm glad to see that it's still going. Yeah, for sure. I reached out to like a lot of my like uh, people, my friends that graduated a couple of years ago and they're like pretty surprised that we're uh, we're still around and I'm actually pretty happy to actually keep this it's thing doing going pretty right. good right now. Yeah, that we got a lot of executive members and members at large and uh, we're starting to get people for the newsletter to contribute. So yeah, it's looking pretty good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all about creating that experience for our students while they're in college, right? And it's it's yeah. obviously a good time to uh, meet new people and it's like the only way online you can actually meet new people <laughs> really. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it's yeah. also really good from an employment standpoint. Um, it uh, there are very few things uh, or at least decent local opportunities you can find for volunteer work uh, but being involved with the VBA um, it's a good resume pattern for sure yeah for sure I always uh, try to point that out for uh, students I know yeah. that we've had a good track record of uh, BBA executive members going out to do uh, amazing things like Stephen Polowski and you for, for example um, Who, who's Stephen I'm not familiar with that guy yeah, he's a he's actually a, a DevOps developer. Um, he came in uh, last year to talk come talk to us. Pretty much yeah. the same format um, that, that we're doing right now. Yeah, sure. but uh, yeah, it's, it's always a good time to just talk to students, see what their experiences are. Yeah. Is there anything like uh, you miss from uh, your college days? I know that you run a business now, but uh, do you still keep in touch. <laughs> lack of responsibility would be the probably the one thing I miss the most. <laughs> It's uh, uh, it doesn't get easier after school. This is uh, when you are um, faced with a midterm or an exam and you're sweating. Um, take some very uncomfortable solace in that this is the easiest time that you will have in your career. It's funny you say that because we actually don't have exams anymore. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah it's oh. crazy. They just give you a bunch of assignments or there's one big project yeah. to do. You're all it's soft. A... That's what I <laughs> <laughs> Well, they, no. can't, they can't do much, right? Or it's all online and, you know, it's it's either open book test or you do yeah. a big assignment. No, for sure. I, I was a big advocate with the uh, the college staff and um, uh, working with the, the dean and stuff to um, make things more project based um, rather than tests and uh, constantly pointing out how I think after every exam I submitted every major exam uh, like at the end of the year I would submit to the instructors and to the chairman at the time who was Hyder. Um, I gave them a like a little report that said these are the six ways you can cheat on this exam exams are stupid stop <laughs> giving <laughs> like yeah so. there's there's definitely a lot of ways you can cheat online it's uh... It kind of devalues our, our diploma in a way if uh, people aren't actually doing it, but uh, hopefully, hopefully not. It does, and that's true. So, yeah. Any any specific questions about uh, stuff I've done or things you guys are curious about? Or well, yeah, uh, I have like I was, one. Sorry, you go go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I just had this like one like I just want to know like your number one tip on if uh, we wanted to start a tech company, what um, what tip would that be? No. Uh, in the tech field specifically want it want it more than you've wanted anything in your life it sounds like a gary v type of thing but uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say it with a lot less swearing though that's <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um no it's 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 true though like being an entrepreneur um i hate that word entrepreneur like yeah it, i don't know you talk to like so many different organizations and everyone has different ideas of like what that is, um, or when when do you at what point do you become an entrepreneur? Is it when you have a business idea, or is it when you have a business? Because what's the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur? Someone who innovates or someone who doesn't? Like who knows? Anyways, stupid word. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, or start a business. Um, it's it will be like the hardest thing you ever do, and it will take all of you. And then you'll think you've given it everything you have, and then it will take more. Um, and and you just you have to be able to dig deep, um, like you'll you'll have it's the most rewarding thing I've done professionally. Um, it's it's super cool. Like I'm part of building an, a community that puts food on people's tables for them, 
and with them. Like we work together to make this happen. Like it's not, I'm not doing it for them and they're not doing it for just themselves. Like we do it together. Uh, so it's, it's insanely cool, but um, yeah, I, in terms of like ideas and, and what you start, uh, it almost doesn't matter because the things are going to fail a lot. Um, I, I don't think failure is necessarily a good thing, but that's also because I view failure as like different um, than like, you know, people talk about fail fast, fail early. Well, if you failed and learned a lesson, it's not really a failure, is it? So yeah, for sure. For sure. I don't, I I don't that, so. those things as failure. So it's, um, yeah, you're gonna have a lot of ideas that don't work. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, do you like have any regrets actually starting something like this or like anything that you want to share? <laughs> no, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, sure. There's lots I can share. Um, not really any regrets. I mean, it would take entire, I mean, sure. Like, uh, should have invested in Bitcoin. Oh yeah. I think all of us should have. <laughs> you know, like, th th those, those are the only level of regrets that I, that I have with this kind of thing. It's, uh, um, not, not to get too terribly interpersonal, but starting a business, um, like it's given me everything I have and it's taken everything I had. Um, I was married for 10 years. I, then I got divorced. I had a house. I lost my house. I had a car. I don't have a car. I had enough. I just bought my first car a couple or my car back again a couple weeks ago. Um, it's like, it's like this, it takes a lot. Like you, you gotta be able to figure out what your priorities are, what's important and, and what do you want out of life and, um, you know, figure out how to align that for yourself. There's no right way to do it. Um, there's certainly a lot of wrong ways to do it, but you'll, you know, ask good questions and, and you can learn from other people's mistakes, but it doesn't mean you're not going to make your own. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's awesome to, to hear from James. Um, I'm guessing some, like, I just want to know, like, some uh, yeah. key measurements um, that you actually define, like, your successes and your employee successes that you, that you know about. <laughs> um, key, key measurements, what are, you, uh, what, are you, what are you looking for in particular? Um, I guess um, what I was trying to come up with was, uh, like, what, what defines success in your eyes in terms of actually to your employees or in terms of your company and your your values do do a little better than we did yesterday that's that's a success I like that. I like that. they don't all have to be big um yeah i mean there's there's definitely like big milestones that that we hit but um like we get we did our first round of investment uh one year ago um which was good for the business obviously so like there's a measure of success that an external source saw the value of our company and said hey we want to give you a bunch of money to make sure you keep doing the things you're doing. And we're like, cool, that's, that, that's a measure of success on some level. Um, but it also comes with a different level of pressure too. For sure. For sure. I'm guessing, how do you like actually talk to your like stakeholders and build those like relationships? Cause I, I know that when you're a student, you don't actually know about this type of things. Um, but actually yeah. talking to stakeholders really. <laughs> Um, yeah, usually we put our stakes on the plate. We don't like to hold them. <laughs> weird. Um, yeah, lame jokes. I can dig it all day. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean we're 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 still technically like more of an R and D company uh, than anything else. We do a lot of B two B and custom development. So, I mean, how we talk to our stakeholders in particular is a lot different. Um, like I just got off right before this. I was on a call with um, an accountant from one of my clients companies um, discussing the integrations between their accounting software and what we're currently building um, to do a cost benefit analysis on whether or not it's worth it for us to build out this feature so that our client could save money. So where, you know, where does that, where does that go? Oh, wow. That's a, uh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. That's like definitely something you don't really learn as a bit student. I'm not sure if any. Yeah, of the no. BTN. Yeah, that's like, did you already have this experience coming into the program or was just no. you taught yourself? No, oh, wow. I, I just, I, I don't know. I guess I was a little arrogant. <laughs> um, yeah, just just confidence and I'm good with people. Um, the, the programming stuff was always the hard stuff for me. It wasn't the, the people, the ideas, all that stuff is, um, I don't want to say it comes naturally. Those are skills I've developed in other areas of my life. Um, 
but uh, the programming was especially tough. Um, I'm dyslexic. Um, uh, so c coding with that was, uh, <laughs> was a real challenge. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, as long as you spell everything wrong, it's fine. <laughs> right? Just it's it's about consistently misspelling something and then you're, you're golden. <laughs> but yeah, you try arguing with Damien or uh, or or Mike with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think yeah, Dave, Damien's still a programming instructor, and I'm pretty sure you still have, have uh, Mike por portrait, portraits, por yeah, um, Mike, yeah, yeah, Mike is when, the, when Damien one. taught you, was he did he always have the you know fancy pro streamer setup? He's got this like intro waiting screen with music, he's got a, a break screen, he's got an outro screen. Like he <laughs> oh, uh I, I transferred out of Damien's class. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I would I would recommend if you're not in Damien's class, go into it. You'll be a better programmer for it. Um, but uh, I I knew what I was in school for, and I wasn't going to school to learn programming. Um, I wasn't going to school to learn networking. I was going to school to learn how to speak the language of the people I want to work with. Oh, interesting. So you know, when we talk about different data structures or types of algorithms or being able to solve problems from a different mindset and with a different set of critical thinking skills that developers are taught, um, I can communicate with my development team on a much more interpersonal level than, than a lot of my, my colleagues can that are also running or starting businesses. Like they don't know what their development teams do. Right, they get a set of business requirements and they go, uh, "Build it." I don't know how. It's <laughs> to it, right, but when I'm when I'm sitting down at the table and talking to clients, I I understand database architecture. I understand, um, you know, uh, coding methodologies and best practices and stuff. So as I'm coming up with solutions and ideas with clients, I'm already bridging that gap. And then when I translate those requirements to my development team, um, I'm giving it to them in a language they already understand. So it's, yeah. it allows for much clearer lines of communication, for sure. I have a question kind of on that topic where you said, you know, you didn't really go to school for programming and the technical mm -hmm. skills necessarily. So in hindsight, do you think you would have been better off taking BTM or are you glad you took a bit to know those technical skills? Do we have BTM members in the group? Not sure. Awesome, possibly. Um, I know my I brother off. actually attempted BTM for this RSC and he doesn't recommend it. He says that bit is way better. Yeah, yeah, he says that. Well, right. I work as a as a business analyst, and I I can't understand why it's better than if you're going down that road. But uh, in terms of knowing a bunch of technical skills, uh, BTM is definitely a, a little bit better. But well, you know what? I feel like you get in trouble for it anyways. I'm not associated with the college anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. BIT sure. is a far superior program. BTM is a cash cow for the college to make a buck. Yeah. Um, Fair enough. It's, uh, I mean, just statistically, you, the sheer number of international students that, that go into BTM is not an accident. Um, it's advertised overseas um, as an option, as as a different, you know, uh, way to, yeah, I see your head's nodding over there. It's, because because uh, my brother literally blames the, like, the agent who advertised the course to him back home. Yes. Like, I'm from India, and the agent was told by the college, like, this is the, like, the best we have to offer for international students. Interesting. Yeah, and he said that he regrets listening to the agent and he should have listened to his cut. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. that. Um, Interesting. Sure, I, I totally agree. It's um, I, I'm not a fan of how that um, that that program works. Um, I mean, it's been a couple of years since I've seen it. Um, I was a part of the college when that program was rolled out. Um, I was in the project space when they first started including BTM students, um, and they just they, they don't have a leg up on any sort of technical skills that a BT, that an IBIT or that a, um, um, a BIT student has um, or the capability of having. Um, you know, I think the, the interpersonal skills that you get from the BTM program are more easily sought after on your own than the technical skills would be in order to bridge the gap on the BIT side. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, if you if you wanted to do both, you could do more on your own outside to learn more BTM than you could bit. And even then, the communications and PDEV in bit are 
pretty good courses. I've already found them very valuable. The oh, the personal development stuff. Personal development, and oh. there's just the communications hey. one as well. What do you? What thank do you thank goodness, I had to take I had to take uh, communications. I didn't have to take PDA. Yeah, we we have to take both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um I also challenged the business courses in my last term. I didn't have to take those either. Oh, sick. Yeah. Um, Reid, you have a you have a question for us? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, James, thanks for coming. You mentioned um, you have five developers working for you. What um, um, what what did you look for in terms of in terms of hiring there? Because um, I guess that's the first part of my question. And the second part is: is there something else above and beyond Bit? Um, I know I know you can transfer credits to U of W. I think and and go for your BSc. I know a lot of um, people here uh, already have their CCNA certificate. You know, is there anything above and beyond BIT that you'd recommend? And what do you look for when you're hiring? Um, honestly, I could care less about your academic credentials when I'm hiring. Um, I when I do technical interviews with people, um, I look more for your ability to communicate a problem and solution domain than I do even whether or not you got the right answer. Um, it, it's it's all about communication. It's I firmly believe I can uh, not only I, but my team, like we can teach you the technical skills. Um, we can improve those technical skills, but if you don't have the ability to communicate and, and play on a team, then we're not going to be able to build those skills. And even if you come in with a slightly better than average, you know, level of understanding of, of the particular skill set that we're looking for at this time. If you don't have the communication skills, you're not going to grow. The same way that that we would be looking for you to grow in a startup. Sure. Um, yeah. So in terms of uh, just to be like a little bit more direct in terms of what I would recommend uh, in terms of um, other academic credentials, even though I don't particularly look for them, that doesn't mean other people don't. Um, I would say um, get your get your BIT. If you want to do your BSc through U of uh, U of W, it is a decent option. Um, however, I think it's through the universe, University of Athabasca. Um, if you couple this with a year or two of professional experience, you can actually go straight into your Master's of Computer Science. Um, and if you're just looking for something on paper, um, no one's going to care about your bachelor when you've got a master's. Um, so you don't actually need the bachelor to do that through um, the University of Athabasca, although it will cost you a little bit more. Um, yeah, um, the biggest thing that I look for in terms of um, that's not communication style um, within the hiring process is your interest in what it is that you do. Um, I want to see what your aspirations are. I want to know what your goals are. Um, if you don't have goals, if you don't look like you enjoy programming or enjoy the job that I'm about to give you, um, then it's not like you're not going to continue to grow in that space. You're just always going to be looking for a paycheck. You're not looking to develop yourself. So when your instructors tell you things like put together a portfolio, yeah, it, it counts. Um, I don't, however, agree with the statement that all the work you do in school can be put into your portfolio and that becomes your portfolio. Um, that, well, it's better than nothing, to be sure. Um, it doesn't speak to any level of passion. Passion's only going to come from um, some problem you've solved outside of, of school, something extra. And it doesn't have to be huge, right? But like, explore building like, hey, this was uh, this is a piece of my portfolio for web development and this is the project we did in school. And then I decided to code the exact same project in three different languages. Right, that's that's the kind of stuff that we would look for. That's super basic. It doesn't take any creativity. Yeah, that's that's definitely big time, James. Awesome. Thank you. James. I just wanted uh, to ask something along these lines. The one, the, the the thing, languages and portfolios. Like, how far do you think like uh, stuff like tech stacks and languages and that is important? For example, you're looking for someone in a particular language, but I have experience in something other than that language. How important is that? Um, it's definitely more important when you're looking at like a networking or like a system admin kind of position. Uh, those things typically tend to be more pigeonholed into the 
I'm not going to call them languages, um, but into the style of system that you're used to working within. Um, a, a good example would be Microsoft, um, you know, server, right? Um, or, you know, doing uh, just regular like open source LDAP stuff or um, Linux based um, server management or, or whatever else it may be like there's that would be where I have more of an issue in terms of what you do or don't know. I would want you to come in with more experience, but in terms of the rest of the tech stack, um, like if you know, you know, the basics of, you know, at least two, maybe three languages, um, you're gonna learn the basics of any other language very quickly. Um, you know, might put you through a little bit of a test to be like, hey, read this documentation and how would you solve this problem using this, you know, use the documentation, just go through it. Like we're in an interview process, we're not trying to get rid of you. We're trying to figure out why you, right? When I, when I approach hiring somebody, it's always about like, Hey, why, how is this person going to be a good fit? We're not looking for how you don't fit. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Thank you. I'll also say this because I won't get in trouble for it since I'm not associated with the college. Anything Dan Greenberg says about getting hired, forget about it. <laughs> it's too bad that he's uh, he's an instructor now and he's a. Uh, but Wait, uh, yeah, yeah, he's a uh, he transferred over. He's he's a business management. Oh, instructor. that's yeah. so terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, we lost we lost a lot of connections when he decided to go into teaching, but. Uh, we got a replacement, Jesse, so he's not terrible. But. You guys are better off. Um, no, honestly, he's not doesn't have a great reputation in the community. Um, but uh, not that he's a bad person by any means, just not up to date. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, what was I going to say? Who, so who does your co-op? Um, uh, Je no. Jesse something. I, I don't have the name specifically at the top of okay. my head. <laughs> I don't, I'm not familiar with any Jesse, so either they're new or yeah. I didn't know them when I was there. Yeah, they just they just took them on last last term, I think. Um, yeah, I I hated the co-op uh, program, the way it was organized and designed, um, the way it functioned. Um, I rebelled against the system. I actually went to British Columbia for my co-op. Um, yeah, yeah. I looked when I looked at your LinkedIn. It's it seems to be all over the place. Um, yeah. So the. Uh, I'm not sure how it works now since there's somebody new in place, so I don't want to knock it too hard. But at least when I was there, um, there was a huge emphasis emphasis put on. Um, that's ironic, hey? When you go to say the word emphasis and you put the emphasis in the wrong part of the word, <laughs> that's funny, right? Yeah. Um, there, there's this the huge pressure put on your GPA, um, and so the companies hiring for the co-op programs straight up they're just looking for the highest gpa so and dan was organizing students by gpa so your 4.0s and higher were getting the first round of interviews and then your 3.6s to fours were getting the next round and like so on and so forth um and i found that immensely frustrating um just for the record i was on honor roll at the time so um i i personally wasn't concerned but my issue was i had a lot of international friends um, uh, primarily from the Chinese community when I was in school and we helped each other. Um, again, being dyslexic, like I needed more help with my programming than I was getting in class. So um, I had um, a, um, a immigrant friend, uh, new to Canada uh, person, teach me programming in more detail and I helped them with English. Um, so we had like this back and forth process, but their GPA was significantly lower. Like they were just barely passing and it had nothing to do with their technical ability. They were actually an instructor for programming and database systems in China. And they knew this stuff inside and out. It simply came down to an understanding of the English language. And um, that's where they struggled and that's where their grades came short. So I'm looking at this co-op program at these opportunities going out and it just frustrated me to no end that there was somebody's skill level that is so not reflected by the process. Um, so yeah, I, I argued with with Dan pretty endlessly about this and ultimately ended up 
finding a loophole in his system and I got my own co-op um, and I made sure it was far enough away that he wouldn't be physically capable of doing an on-site visit. <laughs> yeah, going, going to the West Coast is, isn't like apparently their, their technology is a little bit better compared to the, you know, the central centralized stuff here that we have in Winnipeg. But uh, how do you yeah, think definitely, definitely applaud, applaud you for that. Yeah. How, how do you figure the technology is different? Well, in, in terms of like, so I know that Winnipeg um, tends to be a little bit more behind in terms of tech. Um, I know that we have the Silicon Valleys in the West Coast and then it slowly from my understanding, it slowly migrates to the to the centralized um, Winnipeg. Yeah, I, I don't think we have any issues in terms of uh, technology curve. Um, right. The the issue we have is people that are capable of working with particular technologies tend to leave because they can make more money in other places where uh, it's not minus forty four in the morning yesterday. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so it's it's less of a technology problem as it is a people problem, um, and with people being able to hire and work remote, that's that's not really that's not really a thing anymore. Um, I'm going to quote 60 minutes uh, from last night, so I don't get in trouble for using an incorrect stat. Um, <laughs> but um, according to 60 minutes, um, before the pandemic, uh, one in 67 jobs was hired purposely for remote, um, and now uh, one in seven jobs is purposely for remote. Um, it's a massive increase. So the level of opportunities and different things now you gotta you gotta keep in mind too like the highest paying jobs um and the most creative jobs are going to continue to be not remote um it's there are studies on both sides of the fence in terms of productivity that show oh cool people who work from home are more productive uh people who work from the office are more productive um, what a lot of people don't tend to see, they just use the stat to pad their own personal argument. Um, but really what the numbers start to show, if you dig into them and look at multiple different studies and go ahead to your own research, is that uh, creative work um, is better done in a group setting um, than it is on your own, especially when a team is involved. Um, when you're on your own uh, working in isolation, you don't have the the feedback loop necessary to be able to iterate over ideas. You don't get the you're wrong or hey, I think that would look better over here or try this. So uh, things that are creative and when uh, people need to work together in teams, um, it's more beneficial to do it in person. Video helps, but I mean, in terms of body language, I'm I'm missing so much, right? Like even just looking at you, like I can't tell if you're listening or paying attention, or maybe you're twiddling your thumbs under the desk, like, I don't know. Uh, but when we're sitting around a boardroom, right, like I can very quickly as you no know, people person, I can identify those that are paying attention, those that aren't, and I can find ways to engage people that wouldn't have otherwise been engaged. And you're going to unlock those aspects in your in your business um, through those people that by, by getting them to engage more. Um, the, the stuff for the productivity working better from home typically tends to be more monotonous, mundane tasks, uh, bookkeeping, uh, being an executive assistant, things that don't require a high level of, of creativity. Um, that being said, even creative jobs don't have um, creativity all the time, right? It's, it's portions of it. So um, here, what we've developed is, is a hybrid. We do part home, part work from the office. Um, so it's, it's a hybrid. Um, and I think a hybrid model is is what is best overall, but that's not to say that there isn't the edge case where an individual works better from the office or from home. I but definitely yeah. prefer in-person classes and, and work in general. I currently work from home just doing like surveys over the phone, just part-time job while I'm in school, but uh, sometimes I find I, I just I lack the social communication that I need. Like sometimes it's so boring and I'm, I guess I'm a little too extroverted sometimes to work from home doing surveys where I just talk to, you know, randoms that are sometimes rude to me rather than a team type yeah. of deal. So I definitely prefer the in-person culture. Yeah. Um, keep in mind too, in terms of in-person and culture and stuff like that, um, this is the best time you guys will have to be able to make networking opportunities with each other before you leave school. Um, I will, I'll, I'll throw out two unsolicited pieces of advice. One, if you are sub 25 or don't have kids um, find whoever is in your network that's over 25 and or has kids and watch how they work 
because they have so much more on the line than you can understand and they will work differently. Learn from them. Learn what motivates people and how they're motivated and figure out how to unlock those things for yourself because you'll eventually be in the same position. I hope, I mean, if that's what you want in life, but just saying like there's, there's a level of, of uh, uh, necessity that comes from going back to school as an adult um, and getting your, frankly, getting your shit together in a different way. Um, so if you're, if you're young, you see those people connect, um, they, you can help each other. Um, they might have knowledge gaps in newer emerging technologies that they're not paying attention to that you do. Um, you might have a little bit more fun doing the stuff than they do. So, uh, make friends. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why we uh, created the BPA at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm kidding. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, those are some really good advice you have, James, um, in terms of networking and getting to know people that actually want, or older fellows um, definitely have a little bit more experience in terms of like, because I know that a lot of younger people, they're a little bit more, they have the energy, but <laughs> um, I know that when you're when you're older, Drive the energy, but uh, yeah. Not that. Well, the the drive the energy is different. Your your energy comes from drive and determination. Uh, the energy comes from the caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's like it's different when you're older and you have like a kid and like it's like you have a purpose and your why. It's a little yeah. bit more meaningful, you know. So yeah. you're doing it just better. Better than speculating, go ask them what drives them. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else have any other any other questions or things you want to know? I just had one little doubt. Like, yeah. uh, I don't know if uh, if you know this, but in the programming community, there is whole this lead code DSA thing, the like data structures and technical interview thing. Like, uh, is that really relevant when you hire people? Because I'm not really sure. What What is this? Like the whole lead code and technical questions when you go for an interview. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I ask technical questions in interviews. Um, yeah, I mean, like there, there's this sort of basic fundamental level where all your instructors are gonna tell you, uh, you need to be able to explain polymorphism and uh, inheritance. Um, and like, cool, uh, I know you've all been asked that question and you've all been told that you should know it. Um, so I'm not asking that question to figure out if you understand polymorphism and inheritance. I'm asking that question to see if you paid attention in class because your instructors told you to know it. Um, so yeah, know, know the answers to those things. Uh, oftentimes, especially if you're gonna go work for a big company, um, you know, someone like, like an Amazon or you know, Bold now is getting pretty big. Um, you wanna go work for the Googles or the Facebooks. Your first interviews with these people are not with the highest of technical people. They are using, you know, they're using elimination tactics, right? Somebody like me, I get a stack of 20 resumes um, and, and I know that half of them are gold and I have to figure out, you know, which one, which one can I, can I work with to polish the best to get the most value for me and for them? Who's gonna be the best fit? Um, and so I get to be a little bit more detailed in a different way, but, you know, Bold is getting 500 resumes for the same position. So they use elimination tactics. Um, so they'll be, oh, you can't answer a basic question, you're gone, right? Because they need to get down to that 20. They need to get down to the, to the fewer where they can then spend the time and effort with technical and senior staff to figure out if you're gonna be a good fit. So yeah, that yes, go learn them. <laughs> I think Reed had a question. Hi, James. Just um, so in terms of uh, going out post grad, um, how should you value yourself? Like when you're uh, at this stage of the interview, when okay, we want you to work for us. How do you know if you're being undervalued or not? Or is there a way to know? Yeah, um, I I think yeah, that's a good question. Um, fairly complex. Um, it, it's going to depend on where you're going. Right. Um, uh, again, I'll use the example of, you know, me versus bold. Um, you know, we're you know, bold's not a startup anymore. Um, they're an established company. Um, when you go there um, as as a fresh out of school, 
you know, or fresh, you know, fresh graduate, um, you mean two things to them, help desk and uh, uh, tax incentive for uh, hiring newly graduated students, right? They're gonna bring you in as low as possible. Um, they're frankly, they don't really care what your value is. You're gonna give them value regardless. And then the decision on whether or not you move up or around in that company is then gonna be based on how you show your value over time. Um, and that, that's a pretty harsh example. I don't wanna pigeonhole Bold into that. I'm just, it's an example. I've never been hired by Bold, so I can't say that for sure. Just you know, throw that out there. Um, versus somebody like me, we're, we're a startup still. Um, so the value is gonna come in, in terms of your, your value, in your values um, and where you wanna go, um, you know, are you looking for a paycheck and benefits or are you looking to be a part of, you know, something that can be bigger than everybody currently involved? Um, it's, uh, it's different, right? Like, you know, when um, we're just about to go into a hiring phase right now um, and you know, we offer employee options, like stock in the company, um, because we can't offer the same competitive wage as Bold or Amazon or another big tech company, uh, but we can offer the potential of a bigger future. So it's your value is really going to depend on what you want out of wherever it is that you're going. So, um, yeah, you just you need to understand what it is you're looking for, what your goals are, and then how do those align with your prospective employer? Um, and then if they align really well, then you're higher value. If they don't align well, then you just need to understand what your goal out of that job is. Um, and then make sure that you're priced appropriately. Um, in terms of negotiating wages, um, it, it shouldn't ever be a closed door conversation. You know, like, what am I worth? Um, if you're concerned about getting lowballed, you know, that's fine. Take the lower offer, but negotiate for different things. Right. Like you can be like, hey, cool. Uh, I wanted to start at 48, but you want to start me at 43. Um, I'll do 43, but I don't want to wait for my benefits. I want an extra week of vacation. Um, or, you know, you can also be like, uh, OK, cool. I'll take the 43. Um, but in one year, I want to be making 52. And so I'd like to paint a picture of what a milestone driven, um, you know, um, level of, of engagement looks like in the company in order to earn that much money, right? If you're not afraid to show an employer your value, they won't be afraid to give you the chance to do it. Very comprehensive. Thanks, James. Cool. I'll always awesome. try not to cheat you with my answers. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good insight that you've given us, James. It's been like a good opportunity to just come talk to us. Um. But yeah, no, this has uh, been great. Um, I know that some of these guys have classes in like 10 minutes, so I don't want to bug them too much. But uh, yeah, I just want to want to thank you, James, for uh, coming to quickly talk to us. It's been a, it's yeah. been a good time. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not particularly in a rush uh, right now. So, I mean, if you guys have more questions or those that want to stay, I'm, I'm happy to talk for a bit longer, but that's entirely up to you guys. For sure, for sure. I'll uh, leave open the, the Discord, or not Discord. Um, you can come join the Discord if anyone else wants to uh, join that, because we'll be having a meeting um, next week um, in terms of just getting more members involved. But uh, yeah. Um, Dean's got his hand raised. Yeah, you can keep chatting all you want. <laughs> yeah, OK. Hey, James, uh, I have a question. When, when, you, when you were taking the BIT program, was uh, the project space also a thing, or was it only co-op? Uh, so they started project, um, the, the very first iteration of it, when um, I was in term one. Um, and that was with BIT space development, took a group of international students who couldn't find co-op jobs. Um, and this is where like it got started. Uh, but it didn't actually kick off. So I was in the first group of entrepreneurs to actually start the project space. So um, it wasn't previously available um, and we made it available. Okay, and I have another uh, question to add to that. Uh, in your hiring experience or maybe your mm, interaction with other IT professionals, mm -hmm. did you see any, any added benefits that uh, may have come from 
them doing project space versus co-op because i know sometimes for instance co-ops they kind of just hire help desk students and they think okay great here we go we have a student who really will not get paid a lot and they're getting their work experience but uh, i've heard different good things about the project space yeah um i mean I'll, I'll give you my golden story which is uh, on my first first round through the project space. Um, I won't drop names just for their own anonymity because I've not asked their permission, but they were a student on my project um, and we needed to figure out what technologies we were still using to develop the product we were looking at. And uh, we inevitably decided on a platform um, and, a, and a system called Kubernetes. Um, um, if you guys aren't familiar with that, get familiar with that. Um, yeah, so we, we learned Kubernetes and then uh, we taught him Kubernetes. And then we we went through the whole development life cycle about how to do CI, CD, red, green deployment, everything with Kubernetes. Um, and then by the time our project was done, um, he put on his profile that he could do um, CI, CD and red, green deployment with Kubernetes. And he was getting job offers without applying. Um, and he ended up getting picked up and was given a, a lead developer position in a company right out of school, making way more money than me. There was no way I was going to be able to afford to keep him on our team. Um, and, and I'm not like, he's a smart guy, don't get me wrong, but no more or less smart than, than anybody else had the potential to be, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, what came out of project was the fact that he got to work with and figure out what technologies he wanted to use and what industry was looking for. So you get to shape the narrative of your experience. Um, and yeah, most projects in the project space are gonna be a crapshoot. They're not gonna work, they're not gonna do anything. Uh, the entrepreneurs aren't gonna engage with you very well. Um, there's gonna be a lot of uh, self-learning that's needed. However, there is a huge, um, uh, community aspect when you talk about what project is and was you get to build it up so much more than your experience in a co-op program because um, frankly I mean anybody who gets hired for a co-op program you are not doing anything meaningful um, and I'm saying not saying there isn't um, a potential you know um, edge case for that but realistically sit back and think about it what company is going to hire at a very basic wage, a non-graduated or almost graduated student to work on anything that's business critical. Like that's that's just a bad business decision. Basically the coffee boy as the co-op, is that what I'm getting? <laughs> no, it's, I mean, you're not gonna be running errands and stuff for people and like, yeah, there's been the odd time where like, you know, people tell horror stories like that and they have <laughs> happened, but legitimately they've happened, um, but, generally you're going to be put on you know working on an old project that's half dead um that the company wants to see if maybe they could revive um they're you're again you're you're a tax write-off and you're a benefit and you're usually a community play right people will be like oh i hire co-op students that's that's for stakeholders it's for their stakeholder conversations to to pump themselves up um, generally speaking uh, from a business perspective it's not a great idea to hire co-op students that you're not intending to keep on board. So usually like if you get hired on as like a level one help desk for a co-op position, yeah, you very well, well might keep that job after, but you're, that's all you are is just, you're just help desk um, versus with the project. Don't, like I said, don't listen to the narrative of, uh, oh, you could get hired on by these entrepreneurs and stay on this project and get a job out of it. That is far less likely. Um, but what is likely is that you will get a better experience out of it. You will learn more and you need to weigh the knowledge you can gain on a project versus the money you can make on a co-op and decide which one's more valuable to your investment in your education. Thanks for that insight. That is and so I, good as a term three student, to be honest. And actually, <laughs> I, I've heard that I, I mentioned earlier, I've heard that there is some projects that you can do in the project space that are and can be paid for. I don't know how that works, but I've heard. Yeah, there's there's a few that are run by um, uh, research programs and they have grant funding. These projects are usually headed up by an instructor, um, in my experience in the past. Um, they're not bad projects, so to speak. But keep in mind, as soon as money is involved, 
your level of control and autonomy goes down. So again, way, way what it is that you're looking for. Like you went to school for a reason, just to gain knowledge you didn't previously have, right? If you look at what a co-op job is worth in terms of dollars in your bank account, you can get a part-time job. Most projects will still support you being able to work. Like they know you got to make a living. Like it's fine, especially being able to work remote. Like it's, you know, f figure it out, right? Like, again, just do your own cost benefit analysis. Why are you in school? Why are you here? What are you trying to learn? Why is it important? And what is actually aligning with your goals of being in school? That's honestly very helpful because I've been debating since term one co-op or project space, co-op project space. So I think that helps me make a better decision. Cool. Follow up question. What is that decision? Well, I, honestly, I'm probably leaning towards project space based on what I've heard from other students as well. Because, uh, yeah, frankly, I, you know, I originally thought, oh, co-op's so great. I'll get instant job experience. I'll get some money and, you know, <clears throat> I might even get back on at that exact exact same company but you're right like all the really co-op experiences that i've seen haven't been anything special and frankly i don't want to just be doing help desk i want to be doing something greater mm -hmm. on a grander scheme so yeah i think I, I i see your perspective there and i'll probably go in that direction i never thought about this question but right after this right after this session now it's going to be on my mind all day because yeah. <laughs> yeah you got me thinking about that the... I, I it was a co-op no go for me but now i'm thinking it's um, keep, keep in mind too, like project is still what you make it. Um, you can get stuck on a crap team with a bunch of crap people um, that you don't like in your classes that didn't try very hard, never engaged, and it's gonna make your life difficult, but it's still your choice and it's still your education. Again, so long as you come at it with a mindset of, it's not about them, it's about you, right? And regardless of how much they hold you back on a project, push yourself, right? Keep pushing yourself. Be the most valuable member of that of that team, and, and you'll do well. Um, the 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 caveat here, not the caveat, that's the wrong word to use. Um, the thing to keep in mind is, um, if not, if too many people choose co-op and they don't end up with a job, then project is second place, and that's going to increase the poor attitudes within the project environment. The more people that choose project as first place, right, are going to come in with the mindset of this is where I want to be. And those are the people that together you're going to succeed really far with. Um, yeah. So just keep, keep an eye out for that and understand that other people's motivations will have an impact on, on your level of success of a project, but not necessarily on the level of your own learning. Makes sense. Yeah. The, the projects that did well were always the ones that the people chose project over co-op. Um, I hired uh, two of my co-op students. They're still with me um, to this day. Um, they own a piece of the company. So like they're like, it's, it's not unheard of. You can grow with the entrepreneurs and you can build a business out of it, but I'll tell you, we're not doing what we did in project. That's for sure. Did you make them do help desk stuff and get coffee for you? <laughs> or did no. you like actually? No, not at all. They were building the framework and the ecosystem for the product that, that we have today. Um, we're just not doing the same thing we used to do. So we had originally started off with peer-to-peer um, uh, uh, -peer tutoring management software um, and learning information systems. You guys are familiar with the, the hub, right? Like the yeah. RSV hub. Uh, we were building a system to replace that. Um, and we actually started working with the college. Uh, they were interested in, in purchasing what we were building. Uh, the U of M was on board um, and uh, the U of W was more on board than the U of M. Um, but it was cool. Like we were talking to big people, but then um, turns out sales cycles um, in the education space are a lot longer than what I was willing to eat ramen for. <laughs> So I, uh, we ended up pivoting, changed the business. Now we build, uh, using the same core structure, uh, we build franchise management systems. Ah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, very, very similar concept. You have a, a student uh, who needs a tutor. Well, you've got a 
a moving company and your technician needs to go to someone's house to move their stuff. It's, uh, it's really not fundamentally that different, right? Like job titles and tasks are really just variables. Very little is, is fixed in place when you start thinking about data structures. So, yeah, and that I'll give credit to the BIT program for helping me be able to think that way. Yeah. Any other questions? I mean, so far you've been very helpful. I think you've answered any questions I've had and it's been a lot of value, so thank you. Yeah, cool. All right, well, um, uh, uh, Justin has my email, I do believe. Yeah, uh, can you link that? Uh, you can give me the link for it and I'll post it in the BBA Discord. We'll uh, send out an announcement. Is there, for... is, there a, is there not a chat in here? Is there a chat? Uh, I think we Oh, yeah, there is no chat. chat. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, what's your name? Disabled oh, it's balance. only available to team members. Oh, okay. That makes sense. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give my email to those that are here. Okay. So. Um, and with the express um, condolences that if you did not make it, um, don't send me an email. <laughs> um, so it's it's James, it's my first name, J-A-M-E-S, at K-A-R-V-E-I-T dot C-A. Yeah. So, Got it. It's in the recording, so I can go look back yeah. at that. And, uh, yeah. But, hopefully uh, but, not, not too many people reach out to you. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if um, this is a th this is a thing I do often, where I will tell people I'm willing to help or answer questions or uh, offer guidance, whatever. Um, be an ear, um, offer you know some critical thinking in in terms of ideas or whatever, and I'm willing to do that. Um, Ninety nine percent of people will never take me up on that offer. Um, yeah. I don't know why. So I just I'll I continue to offer, but uh, understand that like, you know, that's it's up to you guys, right? Same thing with with what you get out of project is what you get out of project. If if you want to talk, if you want to have a conversation, you let me know. Uh, but I'm not going to chase you down for it. So right on. You definitely have the good mindset for for all this stuff that we're going through right now. <laughs> I understand your pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, right. So, and, uh, and girls, I, I know I, I saw uh, one one girl in the video there before. I don't know how many there are, so I'll say thank you, uh, everybody, um, whatever. She's you. actually an instructor, if you didn't know yeah. that. Oh, There's so actually two yeah. instructors at here. While you were, while, while you were uh, bashing Ben Greenberg, I, just, <laughs> I, I, I was kind of like, oh, she's an instructor, what she's going to think, but yeah, you're out of college, you ain't got nothing to learn. Yeah, I, uh, I'm gonna get in trouble now. There we go. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So. No, she. she, 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 uh, she I think she was listening to what you were saying. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Uh, oh, <laughs> the same thing I was gonna mention too. So I've actually thought about in the past, um, if one of you guys could reach out to me and give me the name of um, whoever is doing the co-op program stuff, as well as uh, whoever is in charge of organizing you guys going into project. Oh, there we go, Jesse Wilson. Yeah, yeah. Send me send me their contact information because what I've wanted to do for a while, uh, but haven't had time in the last year. But also, COVID makes it possible. Is I wanted to organize um, doing a project term through my company. Um, so not a paid co-op. We'll be very clear. We're a startup and we have no money, but uh, we are an R and D company. So there's lots of things that we are working on and we understand how to work with students. So there's things we can do um, project wise that you know, we could get people doing some potentially meaningful work um, <laughs> uh, and, and see where those fits are. Because honestly, that's the best way for me to find future employees is, you know, do you have the grit, the motivation, the, the, like, the ability to build the skills necessary to be a part of a larger team um, yeah so I would uh, I would like to try and pose that to them to see if they'd be interested um, uh, doing something along those lines awesome yeah that, that's awesome and I know I love you know reaching out to previous um, executive members alumni it's the convenience of our discord server right and we can just reach out to any of these guys really um, to yeah. come talk to us 
That's cool. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely exciting. Um, but yeah, it was uh, definitely nice meeting you, James. It's been yeah. a it's been a blast getting to know uh, obviously alumni and other students here. I haven't yeah. met some of you guys, but uh, yeah, it's been yeah, fun. Thank you, James. I yeah. appreciate it. Being motivational and also inspirational and informational. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I that's the word I would go for. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We we will have events like this, guys. If you guys are interested, we have like a bunch of security analysts coming to talk to us. If you guys are interested in that route, spread the word. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks for coming out to today's event, and uh, have a good rest of your night. Thanks for your time, guys. Bye. Thanks, James. Bye, James. Okay, Bye. thank you, James. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.